So thank you all uh, for coming and we'd like to welcome Jeremy Ng. Um, so he's coming to us as he's a postdoc at the Center of Journalology, which is hard for me to say, at um, the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. And so he's been working in publishing for what, seven years now? Um, and he's working on some projects that um, along with uh, David Moore and Alan is, is, is involved. Um, and EBSCO is one of the sponsors of um, looking at um, the reporting, dissemination, um, and publication of research. And so Jeremy's going to share one of his projects with us today. Um, we're going to hold questions, please, till the end. Um, I will monitor the chat, so if you have something you don't want to forget, you can put it in the chat, um, and I will read it out to Jeremy at the end, um, or you know, raise your hands, and I can help moderate um, that way. But Thank you very much, Jeremy, for agreeing to talk to us today, and I will hand the mic over to you. Well, thank you very much, Jill, for the kind introduction, and uh, thanks to everyone at EBSCO for uh, providing me with the opportunity to uh, uh, chat about this project today. Um, so as, uh, as Jill mentioned, uh, my name is uh, Jeremy Ng, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. Uh, this is based in Ottawa in Canada, and um, uh, I want to speak with you today about a research project that I've been leading for approximately the last year or so, give or take. Um, and this uh, project is titled Recommendations for the Development of Guidelines for Scholarly Publishers for the Creation of a New Journal. Uh, before giving my talk, I uh, uh, have no competing interest to declare. And uh, I'll leave the slide up for um, just a few moments here. Uh, if anyone would like to scan the QR code on the screen, um, and if for some reason your QR code uh, scanner is not working, you can also access it uh, using the citation or the DOI link. Um, but we have uh, completed this project, and it's currently under consideration at a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, but prior to submitting it to a journal, we have uh, pre-printed, uh, we've pre-printed the study in full. So if anyone's interested in uh, viewing the um, the full manuscript, uh, they're welcome to do so here. Uh, I've left the um, ability for everyone to move uh, their slides, and so you're welcome to revisit this uh, this slide as I move through my talk. Um, so. Very briefly, I, I just want to provide a, a little bit of an introduction to the work that we're doing prior to jumping into the uh, results. Um, so for researchers, the importance of reporting research findings transparently, completely, and in credible journals is often emphasized. Um, but in comparison, very little focus is given to the role uh, new scholarly journals play in supporting this process. and. Uh, particularly the obstacles associated with it. And um, in order for a new journal to better serve its intended community, there are certain steps that uh, a publisher uh, ideally should take. And the first being uh, to clearly identify and describe the aim and scope of, um, of the proposed new journal. Uh, such a statement should outline the journal's intended overall objectives, uh, the need it aims to fill, uh, the subject or subjects that it will cover, and the types of articles ultimately that it aims to publish. Um, and the statement of aims and scope uh, will also provide a basis on which other decisions will be made, of course, as you can imagine, uh, such as what will be the journal's peer review policy, what are the authorship guidelines, um, content types, uh, just to name a few examples. And in addition to these um, sort of community specific considerations, uh, a new journal should also uh, seek to establish uh, credibility, I would argue. And this includes adopting and upholding established best practices, standards, and, and emerging norms. Um, but it also means selecting competent editors, uh, competent editorial board members that will ultimately support the scope uh, and the mission of, uh, of a proposed new journal. So there are many considerations, activities, and important decisions involved in successfully starting uh, and then subsequently maintaining a new journal. 
uh, formal guidance on how to navigate such matters would undoubtedly be very valuable to, I think, both large and small prospective publishers uh, or current publishers who seek to create new journals alike. And not only could such guidance support equity by providing instructions on best practices, um, but I think this type of guidance may also help uphold the quality of scholarly publishing by identifying and setting a, a required minimum criterion for uh, launching a journal. And given this need for formal guidance on, on scholarly journal creation, the aim of this present study uh, that I'm going to speak to you about today was to conduct a scoping review to identify, capture, and describe existing guidance documents for uh, starting a scholarly journal, specifically in the biomedical space. And um, we chose to focus on biomedicine as community behaviors and drivers that a new journal would need to reflect um, could be expected to be widely similar within this particular field. So uh, prior to beginning uh, this study, we, we developed a protocol and um, this can be found on the open science framework and I provided the link uh, for you here. Um, and so on open science framework, you can find both the protocol and the completed preprint uh, preprinted study. Um, all study materials, data, everything can be found uh, here at this link and um, uh, the study was conducted as a scope and review with um, the completed review uh, reported in, in accordance with uh, PRISMA uh, SCR, uh, which is the PRISMA scoping review statement. So for those of you that may be less familiar with um, uh, scoping review methodology, and, and if everyone here is familiar with it, I, I do apologize uh, as this may be um, basic knowledge, but for those of you um, who may be less familiar, this is this is essentially a summary on my screen here um, that uh, that is taken when undertaking a scope and review. And so the five steps that are typically followed um, are first to identify the research question, uh, next to identify relevant studies, uh, to select the studies, uh, next to chart the data, and then uh, finally to collate, summarize, and report the results. So I'm going to go through um, the steps in sequence just so that you can see how our scope and review um, uh, was modeled based on this framework. And so in step one, we sought to answer the, the research question that I had mentioned um, just now. And um, I think one of the things that, that is important to note um, specific to our research question is that while we, um, you know, we certainly acknowledge that there are several business and research related decisions that need to be made when establishing a journal. And for the purpose of this particular project, um, we, we were primarily interested in um, collecting recommendations pertaining to the research related decisions and, and not the business related ones. Um, in step two, we, we search for relevant studies by conducting two separate searches. Um, uh, and so well, I should rephrase that it's not two separate searches, but two separate types of searches um, with multiple searches within each type. Uh, the first type was uh, bibli bibliographic database searches. Um, and so you can, uh, you can see some of the um, academic uh, bibliographic databases here that we searched. And the second type was a gray literature search. Uh, and these uh, database searches were, were executed on, on January of this year. Um, uh, all databases were um, within the bibliographic category were searched from uh, their dates of inception to January 14th of 2022. Um, we didn't place any publication restrictions because we felt in, in such a situation um, relevant uh, articles could come in many different formats, could be original research, could be review, could even be a commentary or an editorial. Um, and all references were uh, entered into um, an EndNote file for processing and we used Distiller SR as our software for deduplication and screening. Um, Depicted here is an excerpt from, from Table 1 
uh, which contains our uh, bibliographic database searches for articles um, that we were searching for, and, and a search strategy was um, first developed in Medline uh, by our uh, information specialist at uh, at our inst uh, academic institution, Lindsay Sakura. Uh, and later, uh, this was uh, adapted for use in the remaining other uh, bibliographic databases that we searched. Um, all of these search strategies were further peer reviewed um, by another research librarian. Uh, so with respect to the gray literature searches, um, this was um, or, or a decision was made to search the gray literature uh, because we wanted to um, also capture guidance documents published outside of uh, standard peer reviewed literature. Um, and we felt that there may be a very high possibility that uh, guidance for the creation of a new journal may come in um, information or resources outside of what would be published in traditional scholarly journals. And uh, this was accomplished um, sort of twofold. Um, firstly, organizations which may have uh, been sources of illegible gray literature, such as websites of publishers, uh, publishing associations or organizations. Um, these were sourced into a list and reviewed by our team of co-authors. And uh, there is a completed list, obviously too, too long to list here, um, but we show a portion of it and, and the full list is in our appendix of our manuscript uh, that I just mentioned in the preprint, if you'd like to see it. Um, so after finalizing this list, each organization's website was searched using the term starting a new scholarly journal. And uh, if a search bar was pr uh, present on the given website, then it was used. If not, we searched a site via Google. Um, and our second method, in addition to searching these organization websites, was to also conduct general searches on Google itself, um, as well as YouTube using the same uh, search term. And um, only the first 100 results, obviously, as you can imagine, uh, many, many search results would um, uh, result from, from searching Google and, and YouTube, but we looked at only the first 100 results returned from each website. Um, and once all alleg illegible items were identified, we reviewed each item's reference list, uh, if they had one, and sources and, and, and cited items to, to identify any additional um, illegible items. So in, in step three, um, so step three is selecting the studies. Um, and to do this, any document that characterized or described guidance for uh, creating a new um, journal was included in this um, in, in our list of illegible uh, articles. Uh, this was regardless of whether or not the document was evidence based. And so we uh, initiated the study with the assumption that there may not be necessarily a lot of guidance out there. And so that's why we chose to make that decision. And all study designs and narrative documents relating to uh, the field of biomedicine were included. Uh, we placed no limitations on geographic region of where the authors of uh, any potentially illegible um, articles or documents came from or the year that the document was published. Um, the only exception to to this was that we only included English uh, English language content um, just due to resource limitations. So with respect to step four, uh, charting the data, we began to um, uh, chart this data and prior to data extraction, um, a, a data extraction form was uh, first created and then piloted. Uh, three authors um, conducted a pilot data extraction for bibliographic sources and uh, separate three authors conducted a pilot extraction for the gray literature sources. And um, each author independently extracted data for the first four sources returned in their respective searches using the developed data extraction form. Uh, once this was completed, the authors of each team met to compare results, uh, resolve any conflicts, and the data extraction form was then revised accordingly. Uh, this revised form was then used for all uh, following ex extractions and um, 
again, if, if you are interested in uh, seeing more details about this, this is also located in the appendix in our posted preprint. Um, our extraction forms were completed in two steps. So firstly, we reviewed the titles and abstracts of all obtained research articles using our, our screening questions, uh, both independently and in triplicate. And uh, once this was completed, full text of eligible articles were checked to see if they met our inclusion criteria. Uh, the following information was then extracted. Um, so we collected uh, the corresponding author's name, organization, uh, the organization name, uh, the country, the publication year, the study design, and the journal name if, if it was published in a journal. Um, and we also extracted any um, categorized, uh, any recommendations which we tried to categorize. And I'll speak, uh, I'll speak about this in greater detail in, in subsequent slides. So in our last step, we, um, we use both quantitative and qualitative methods to analyze our data. Uh, after completing data extraction, a list of recommendations for creating a new journal was generated in duplicate by two authors from the included sources. And the extracted recommendations were uh, initially grouped into categories loosely based on um, a study written by one of our colleagues, uh, Kelly Kobe. And um, if a recommendation did not fit into an existing category, a new category was created and each of these recommendations were coded independently and again in triplicate and later finalized. Uh, included sources were also categorized by evidence dimension, meaning um, whether the recommendations were informed by evidence uh, or research or primarily uh, by expert opinion or expertise. And uh, following this, descriptive data was collected, and this included uh, details such as the author's name, year, country publication, journal name, and source type. Um, and the main goal here really was to identify thematically grouped characteristics of uh, recommendations pertaining to scholarly journal creation. Um, what we didn't do is we did not formally assess the methodological quality of the sources from which the uh, characteristics were, were extracted. That, that was largely beyond the scope of this, um, this project. Um, the resulting recommendations were uh, initially organized into 13 uh, different themes, um, and uh, these are listed um, on, uh, on the slide here, uh, or at least some of them. Uh, however, we later grouped similar categories into broader themes using a deductive thematic analysis approach. So um, ultimately, this, um, this step resulted in nine final themes, which you can see they're all on, on your screen now. Um, and um, I won't, I won't uh, spend the time reading them all out, but I will talk about some of them in, in subsequent slides. Um, so this is a, a summary of our results. I, I do apologize. This is a bit of a, um, a small uh, slide for um, the text is a bit small, but Essentially, this is our figure one of our manuscript, and it's a Prisma diagram that details our search results. Um, and uh, I'll read out some of the key uh, numbers in this diagram just to make it easier for everyone. So our searches generated a total of um, just about 5,600 records and uh, about 5,000 uh, 351 records were titles or abstracts of bibliographic sources, um, whereas 276 of the records were um, gray literature sources. So uh, after screening titles and abstracts of these uh, 5,351 uh, sources, we excluded the vast majority of them, uh, 4,600 or so. And this left a little over 700 uh, full text to be assessed further. Um, so in combination with the 276 gray literature sources, there were a total of 1,003 uh, full text sources that were screened in the scoping review. Um, so 966 were excluded for um, a host of reasons. 
uh, the vast majority of them uh, just simply did not provide guidance to uh, scholarly publishers for journal creation. And so some of you may may wonder why we had originally included so many. And um, in this particular case, I think it was warranted because the sometimes it's very difficult. It was very difficult to determine whether a given source provide a guidance on the creation of a new journal just based on their title and sometimes even based on their abstract. Um, as you can imagine, it's it's a fairly broad research question, and so we we did spend uh, quite a careful amount of time and effort looking at any full text that we thought uh, uh, might be potentially legible just based on the title and abstract. Um, so, so that was the reason for, for the vast majority of those exclusions. Um, in addition to that, 45 sources were uh, excluded because they weren't published in English, so a, a fairly small amount, and then uh, ultimately only two sources out of the more than 5,000 were uh, irretrievable, uh, even after getting assistance from uh, the academic li librarian. Um, so what this meant with, was that uh, full text of, um, uh, so we removed four duplicates, so that resulted in uh, 33 sources in total that were legible and included in this review ultimately. Um, all 33 included sources were published between 1998 and this year. Uh, they originated from uh, nine different countries. And the majority of the sources, oddly enough, were actually blog posts, um, but we had also captured uh, other sources, informational guides, research articles, YouTube videos, organizational reports, um, news articles, editorials, uh, and a presentation transcript. And uh, we generally found that the number of sources providing guidance on um, scholarly journal creation uh, more of them were published towards uh, 2022 as opposed to 1998. And uh, full details of this um, can be found in the table two of our um, preprint. Uh, we extracted a total of 433 individual recommendations um, from these 33 included sources. Uh, of these 33 sources, we found only uh, 10 made recommendations informed by evidence. Uh, of these 10 sources, eight cited some evidence-based research to support their recommendations. Uh, one source uh, conducted a formal investigation to inform their recommendations, and one source conducted a consensus approach with their peers uh, to gather information on journal creation. Um, but uh, as you can imagine, we noticed that the majority of our sources, so 23 out of the 33, uh, primarily relied on expert opinion or personal experience as either uh, the author being a journal publisher or editor uh, to inform their recommendations. And um, further details uh, regarding all um, all of this information is is found in our uh, is found in our table three of our preprint. Um, as I mentioned before, these recommendations um, were categorized then into ultimately nine themes, and the themes and definitions used to code these recommendations are found in um, the table four of our of our preprint. Uh, but I've pasted an excerpt of the table um, on, on the screen that you can see now. Um, any recommendation addressing more than one theme was coded multiple times. Uh, and we noticed that all sources made uh, multiple recommendations across different themes. Uh, anywhere from three to 32 recommendations were extracted from each source. And although we extracted 433 recommendations in total, we found that there were only 51 actual unique recommendations. Uh, there was quite a bit of um, overlap across different sources that would provide the same recommendation. Um, So uh, the next few slides will be largely about um, thematic results, which I, I do want to spend a bit of time on, as I think this would probably be most interesting to, to this audience at least. Um, 
So our first theme was what we call journal operations theme, and that contained the most recommendations out of all nine themes. Um, the most common recommendation in this theme was to identify the gap or, or niche that a new journal will fill and to build a website for the new journal and determine the publication frequency of the new journal. Uh, a series of technical recommendations were also fairly common in this theme with 14 sources uh, recommending use of a manuscript management software or system, uh, 13 sources recommending applying for an ISSN or registering for a DOI for each article they publish. And um, this theme also contained the most unique recommendations across all nine themes with a total of um, 11. Um, in, in the next theme, uh, the most common recommendation in editorial review processes um, uh, and the most common recommendation across all nine themes uh, was to set up an editorial board. Um, other common recommendations in this theme included creating a detailed editorial meeting structure, uh, devising standards for evaluating article inclusion, and details on uh, editor term lengths and processes for replacing or reappointing editorial board members. Uh, moving to the next theme, uh, peer review processes. Um, some common recommendations included creating a comprehensive protocol for peer review, uh, contacting potential reviewers who work in the journal's field, and setting a timeline for peer reviewer feedback. And um, interestingly, only one source mentioned providing reviewers with some sort of uh, monetary compensation or honorarium as an incentive for review. And I would argue also interestingly and perhaps worryingly no sources um, that we found mentioned anything with respect to the training of the peer reviewers that they plan to recruit. Uh, in terms of the next theme, so this is open access publishing. Uh, we had 13 sources that recommended utilizing specific software to set up and manage a new open access journal and also to determine whether the journal will be uh, open access subscription only or exist as a hybrid model um, journal. Um, copy editing and typesetting was another theme. Uh, that we um, that we uh, reported, uh, and I would say this um, this one received the fewest recommendations out of all of the nine themes. Uh, the most common recommendation in this theme was to deter determine whether or not the copy editing and typesetting um, for the new journal would be uh, outsourced or completed in house. And five sources also uh, recommended utilizing. Uh, specific software such as uh, Quark Express or Adobe InDesign um, to copy edit and typeset articles that they they would publish. Um, in terms of the next theme, uh, the most common recommendations in the production theme were to determine the format of the new journal, uh, determine where the journal will be published, um, will it be online, printed, and uh, to decide the publishing file format as well, whether it be PDF or um, EPUB or some other type of file, XML. Um, the next theme, uh, this is with regards to um, uh, indexing, archiving, and metrics. Uh, so in this theme, 11 sources recommended using platforms uh, such as Scopus and PubMed to index the new journal. Um, uh, while seven sources recommended depositing article um, digital object identifiers or DOIs um, uh, through indexing services such as Crossref. Uh, notably, only one source recommended indexing the new journal on a platform that provides an impact factor. Um, for the next theme, so this one is uh, marketing and promotion. Uh, the most common recommendation was to outline uh, how the new journal uh, will be advertised. So here, eight sources recommended specific advertising methods and six sources specifically 
uh, recommended using social media to uh, improve uh, publicity of the journal. Uh, in contrast, four sources recommended using uh, connections at institutional departments to, to improve publicity. And um, as for our last theme, which is um, split across the slide, funding uh, and funding models, the most common recommendation was to indicate how, um, how the new journal will be funded and subsequently sustained, um, with uh, 23 sources making that recommendation. Uh, other recommendations included securing institutional support and raising funds for the journal through article processing charges. So uh, interestingly, of all the included sources and across all themes, uh, only seven sources considered the potential barriers and our facilitators that publishers may face when implementing um, all of these recommendations that they had provided. And the most common barrier mentioned were limited financial resources and the time commitment required for uh, creating and, and operating a scholarly journal. So that concludes sort of the, um, the, the data that I'm presenting on the, um, the specific themes. And so um, in the next uh, set of slides, I want to uh, describe a little bit about the um, how we we interpreted and analyzed these findings. Um, so so just to recap for everybody, uh, since I, I know I've been speaking for a while now, um, the aim of the scoping review was to identify and describe existing uh, recommendations pertaining to a new scholarly journal creation, um, particularly in the biomedical space. Um, total of 433 recommendations were extracted from 33 included sources and 51 unique recommendations were found. After examining these recommendations, uh, two clear patterns uh, emerged. Uh, I would argue first only 10 of the included sources making recommendations were informed by evidence-based research um, or a rigorously designed study. Uh, in contrast, 23 out of 33 sources, um, which makes the majority of our included sources, um, they made their recommendations based on either expert opinion or personal experience in the scholarly publishing field. Uh, secondly, we found that while many recommendations were made and varied, most lacked uh, details. So, for example, while almost half of our sources suggested building a new website for, um, for the proposed new journal, uh, only five sources actually provided actionable steps one, one could take to actually build this website. Uh, another example um, of this is uh, 30 sources recommended setting up an editorial board, uh, but only five of those 30 sources provided further details, such as um, suggesting processes for replacement or uh, reappointment of editorial board members, uh, or the training, um, how to train uh, journal editorial staff. And, um, and this lack of detail and recommendations, I would say, was uh, largely observed across all um, all nine themes. Um, well, I think I think one of the reasons why I think this work is particularly um, interesting and why I wanted to spearhead this project, um, to the best of our knowledge, no no scoping review or, or review at all for that matter has ever um, identified and mapped the existing evidence based guidance on uh, new scholarly journal creation, despite the fact that arguably many thousands of journals are being created um, every year. Um, however, there are some related findings um, that we've compared our findings with, um, sort of some comparative literature, which you can see on, on the screen here. Um, I think there are a number of implications that are that are important to to state, sort of suggested by by our findings, um, and seeing as how not all publishers are created equally. Um, differences in funding, resources, country of origin, I think 
all of these different factors can can certainly um, serve to either advantage or disadvantage a publisher's ability to produce um, high quality publications, uh, even even with the best of intentions. And um, for example, one source in our review um, suggested offering monetary compensation to peer reviewers uh, to reduce reviewer delays. Um, another source made a similar recommendation suggesting instead that reviewers be given free copies um, of the articles published in the journal or website access to the journal or even provided um, gift vouchers as opposed to, to money. And these approaches are likely not equitable in terms of feasibility across all publishers. Um, in fact, some sources in our review even echoed this, recommending that editors, um, copy editors, reviewers, other other staff members of the journal um, all be recruited on a voluntary basis to minimize uh, expenses for the journal. So I'm not necessarily advocating for one one way or another, but rather I think uh, one of the things that we we can uh, state as an implication of, of our findings is that uh, there has to be some consideration of um, the many different factors that have informed the creation of a given new journal. Um, additionally, more information about common obstacles new journals may face after um, after launch, I think, such as establishing credibility, uh, overcoming a lack of visibility, um, or how to develop a sustainable financial model. The, this may be useful to publishers of new journals, um, especially those new publishers who may have a little experience in this area. Uh, there were recommendations relating to each of these obstacles that we found in this review, but more often than not, we noticed that few details were provided beyond just the initial recommendation itself. Um, and as the primary purpose of a scholarly journal is to enable communication and exchange information, uh, new journals facilitating these conversations also need to be uh, engaging in the transparent and ethical publishing practices in order to uphold the reporting of robust and valid research. And given the difference in the range of advice offered to new journals and the lack of detail in these recommendations that we found from conducting this review, um, I would argue that a consensus approach on how to launch and operate a new scholarly journal may be warranted to uh, better support the quality of scholarly publishing in, in new journals. Uh, to mitigate some of the barriers publishers may face when, when starting a new journal. Um, uh, we believe that the recommendations identified by this review should be further explored and used to inform the development of a guideline uh, regarding scholarly uh, biomedical journal creation. And so that, that's a point for, for future research that, that I would say um, emerged from this particular study. Uh, such a guideline may serve to better standardize the best practices behind and criteria required to launch a successful and credible new journal. Uh, it may also help streamline the resource implications and process of launching a journal for both large and small publishers alike. And um, it's worth mentioning, and, and my hope is that, you know, with EBSCO willing, I, I'll be back and providing a talk on a separate project that I'm working on. Um, but what one such tool currently in development is what we're calling the journal transparency tool at, at our Center for Journalology in, in Ottawa. And this tool is um, the aim of this tool is to provide users um, and that can be publishers or authors or, or researchers with information about um, a journal's operations and, and transparency practices. Uh, for the study, we, we screened all the uh, title abstracts and, and conducted all data extraction, both uh, independently and in duplicate. And so I would argue that was a, a major strength in this study. Um, but with respect to limitations, I think this includes that we, we only included um, uh, sources written or, or in the case of YouTube spoken in English. Um, and so findings from non-English language sources certainly could have been missed. 
um, which could have provided additional insight into um, uh, the situation re regarding recommendations for the creation of a new journal. And as well, while we sought both um, publicly available search results as well as those available to us through our um, university library system, um, we, we still, I think, must acknowledge that a review will not have captured any uh, guidance found in internal or unpublished documents um, created, uh, for example, by, let's say, consultancy companies or uh, publishers themselves, um, things like white papers, for example. And, um, and lastly, considering how limited the, the structured research on this topic is, uh, very few evidence-based recommendations would exist and subsequently be extracted through through the study. And, and I think that was something that we did um, expect for even before initiating this, this review. Um, I'm, I'm towards the end of my talk here and, and so on. Just to conclude, um, the purpose of the scoping review was to identify and describe existing guidance. Uh, on starting a new scholarly biomedical journal. And ultimately, we found that the majority of existing recommendations placed an emphasis on technical journal operations um, and on the role of an editorial board in, in journal creation. In addition, most of the recommendations lacked evidence or were not informed by rigorously designed studies, um, indicating that there are no standardized criteria regarding new journal creation and their publishing practices. Um, seeing as how the range of guidance also differed greatly across all aspects of the publishing process, uh, there seems to be a lack of conclusive information about the scholarly publishing process for new journals. Um, given this, a stakeholder-led survey informed consensus approach on creating and operating a new scholarly journal may better support the quality of uh, scholarly publishing in new journals. And the establishment of such an evidence based guideline uh, as a future direction for journal creation may may allow for the standardization of high quality publication practices across all publishers. Uh, I want to take the take a moment here to to really acknowledge my co authors on this project. Um, everyone on our team. Uh, has done an incredible amount of work to bring this project into fruition. Um, lastly, I have to acknowledge EBSCO uh, and uh, particularly uh, help from Alan, who's also on this call for providing uh, the funding that um, uh, our, our governmental funder in Canada, MyTax, uh, has also very kindly matched. So uh, thank you to EBSCO and, and to MyTax for providing the funding that made this project possible. Uh, I have reference slides here, which you can view um, if they're of interest to you. And this concludes my talk, and I really thank everyone for um, taking the time to attend and, and for your attention. Um, I have a QR code that you can um, scan if you're interested in following my work on Twitter uh, and my handle there if, if you'd rather just type it in. Um, but with that, I uh, I would be happy to uh, field any questions if if anyone has any. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. I also um, would just add to anyone that if anyone do, did want to get information later on um, Jeremy's uh, work from that he showed on the slides where you could scan and find his information or links that um, we do. I do have a copy of um, his presentation so I could send that information to anyone who's interested. Um, and Alan, um, you had your, Alan Kale, you have your first question, so I'll let um, Yeah, I thought this was an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, and, you know, clearly um, with this evolution towards open access that some have, and I'm not, I'm not putting uh, ne unnecessarily blame or motivation. Or, uh, it's too complex without judging. Uh, but what I observed is the concept of the open access. Well, obviously, then you're going to have uh, author publication charges. 
they, there's no revenue, there's no subscription revenue, there's no ad revenue. So, and, and I don't think anybody, at least that I've seen, has done an open access journal where they start having pop-up ads. Uh, although maybe if Google or uh, Amazon or some, some biggie buys the publishing medical journal, we'll, we'll see that. Uh, hopefully that won't, it won't evolve to that. But as someone who does direct, I do ACGME uh, scholarly activity since it, the new scholarly activity requirements just began July 1, 2014. And it, to me, it was very interesting because residents before that didn't have to do scholarly activity. It doesn't mean publishing, but a lot of them want to, especially if they want to go into a subspecialty, they feel this is their ticket in. and we found that, uh, you know, for a case report, a lot of the big journals that have been around for a long time, you know, they weren't going to even publish a case report. And I watched it more, uh, the ICMJE, if I'm, if my acronym is correct, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, which kind of morphed through different names, but finally decided, hey, um, I think this was tied into Henrietta Lacks, the uh, publication of the HeLa cell book, uh, but they uh, said, you need patient authorization. Uh, one case report, you don't need IRB approval, but there's a, a PHI HIPAA concern and people need to accept a written authorization by them or their a legal representative that even though you strip the case report of 18 unique HIPAA identifiers that you cannot guarantee and they need to accept there may be breach of confidentiality or breach of privacy. And because you can just Google different keywords and some go, hey, Joe, wasn't that your mother that had that rare thing? So, um, but I found that a lot of the open access journals were publishing APC charges of $3,000, et cetera. Uh, the European Society of Cardiology, their journal. And I said, look, guys, you don't, you're at a community hospital for your training. I'm consulting here. You, you, you can't afford that unless you're independently wealthy. And it almost looks like you're paying to uh, publish. But um, it became even the norm for one of the online medical education uh, uh, journals, MedEd Portal, that it's now uh, way up there. So I was fascinated by... Um, you just couldn't get uh, the clinical single case report published in any of the, and now the Annals of Internal Medicine, very respected in general internal medicine, the American Journal of Medicine, or when in print, the Green Journal, two of the top internal medicine, not JAMA, which covers everything, not any JM. They came out within the last year or two with a new journal that is geared towards just publishing clinical case reports. And the Green Journal, the American Journal of Medicine, I'm on their national editorial board, so it's, I'm not divulging any non-disclosure stuff. They've said our, our author publication charge is waived. So I said, you, you wanna get it in there, you get it in there. Uh, American, uh, the Annals of Internal Medicine, uh, they're, uh, they don't waive the charge and it's $750. So, you know, and then the publishers are looking for additional charges for preferred editing. They also have other techniques. Again, they're often disclosed in detail on the website. Once you start looking at the instructions for authors and start to go through it. And then after you get published, if you either have no APC charge, they'll offer, well, we offer different promotions through Twitter, through what, you know, um, through various social media accounts. And I thought this is so different than the way, I mean, I'm not necessarily against it at all. I'm open-minded. I love new technology and I like the idea of sharing, but you know, people have gotten this impact factor and depending whose metric you're using and most of the f f folks training with at ACGME certified programs in the U.S., DO and MD, are not going to end up, you know, academic scholars. Um, 
it's kind of fun to do and it's a useful to learn critical appraisal skills. But a promotions committee meeting, I think. Uh, anyway, I just want to kind of get your thoughts on those kinds of those are kind of just the, the observations I've had over the last eight years that I've been intrigued by and whether you were able to pick up the types of journals that are uh, evolving in the last eight years. Yeah, thanks very much for your for your comments and for your question, Alan. Um, I think the first thing I have to start with is probably a, a lot of what you've mentioned I, I'm not specifically familiar with. Um, and I'll also sort of share as a caveat. So, so my training is as an academic researcher. I'm, I'm not a medical um, doctor or any type of other clinician. Um, so some of my observations that, that I may share may be slightly unrelated to this project and also slightly unrelated to the work I do at, at um, Center for Journalology where I'm affiliated. Um, but yeah, I, th I think a lot of the points that you make are, are um, are quite interesting. Certainly the open access movement itself. Um, it was, uh, you know, uh, a movement that was born, uh, I think probably a couple decades or so ago. I, I don't recall exactly. Um, and it certainly stirred up a lot of controversy as it's grown along the way, um, as you've mentioned, where uh, many, many new publishers are are looking at different models for growing journals as opposed to the traditional subscription based model. And, um, you know, certainly I think you know, there could be discussion around sort of advantages versus disadvantages of, of either. And um, probably quite quite a few people are familiar with this idea that open access publishing also gave rise to the predatory publishing or predatory journals movement, um, which which has proven to be challenging for a lot of um, uh, early career researchers or uh, perhaps folks who are not uh, super, super uh, familiar or experienced in publishing, such as medical students or, or residents who are just trying to get their feet wet in research. Um, certainly that that adds an added challenge to navigate in general, just to um, decide where are suitable and legitimate uh, places to publish their work. Um, but I think Probably one of the other interesting things to note is that um, uh, as far as I know, and, and again, not directly related to the findings from this project that I presented, um, th there has been a, a, a very large growth in the number of new journals being created each year. So, so I'm trying to pull this back to, to I guess, the information that I, that I talked about. And so um, I think that, you know, that, that, that can serve as a double edged sword, right? Because you can have an, many new journals, so in a certain sense that does um, allow folks who are less familiar with publishing different options that they can try for and different options to try to get published in. And um, uh, I know that uh, some of my colleagues have mentioned before that essentially sort of if if you try to publish something, you will eventually get it published. It's just you would you would pick lower and lower uh, impact or lower and lower, um, you know, stringent journals. Um, and so again, I think I think that that can definitely be problematic. Um, it, it, it's a really. It's a really tricky, um, in, in my opinion, anyways, um, perhaps some of my colleagues would disagree with me, but I think it's really tricky um, to navigate this, especially for, um, you know, for example, residents or, or early career uh, physicians, early career researchers who who need those publications to um, you know, be able to show that productivity for promotion, tenure, um, uh, academic positions, but at the same time not producing research waste or studies that are not worthy of being published just for the sake of publishing them and, and nothing more. Um, so perhaps that opens a, a, a whole new can of worms sort of surrounding how we should hire, promote, and tenure our, our academic staff. but. Uh, I, I won't speak about that. My my supervisor, Dr. David Mower, is is more so the expert in this field. So I think he he will be giving a talk uh, uh, sometime in, in 2023. So for those Great. of you on the call, um, you, you may want to consider attending that talk as well. But thanks for thanks for that comment, Alan. That's very interesting. You. Great.
Hey, Jeremy, I have a question for you. Um, given that there is, as you showed, so few guidance for people in published guidance for developing new journals, how does this affect what is getting created? So it seems like it has a significant advantage towards um, big, big, large publishers who already have journals and are, are therefore familiar with the process. Um, and so is that kind of creating a little bit of a monopoly with those journals in, in um, preventing a new competition from forming? Or um, how does that, I guess, what do you think that leads the scape, the landscape for new journal uh, creation? Yeah, that, that's a really great question, um, Jill. Uh, I don't think that was specifically investigated in this study, um, but certainly I, I can hypothesize. I think that, um, you know, I think undoubtedly probably everyone would agree that as time has passed, there have been more mega journals or at least mega publishers that have emerged. And um, they, uh, they, you know, in, in some cases, uh, some of them publish hundreds, if not thousands of different journals. Um, and and in many regards, I think they, they've also become very, very good at what they do. And so I think that's, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, they've become very good at what they do and they've become very good at uh, developing the processes that makes authors' lives or researchers' lives easier to get their work published to, to some degree. Um, but I do think that, you know, as, as a result of, of that fact, which I'm not saying in itself is necessarily a bad thing, it has become something that it's very, very difficult for a new journal, especially one that is, let's say, run by society or, you know, has um, uh, poor levels of funding or no funding to start. I think it certainly does make it very difficult to compete with these mega publishers. Um, just simply resources around, you know, amounts of uh, funds available to market a new journal promote a new journal, um, you know, certainly other things like if you already are a very bit big and established publishing house, um, you know, you can create a sister journal to a main journal or a flagship journal that has already seen a lot of success. And as a result, sort of cascade all the manuscripts that maybe you couldn't accept or didn't want to accept in, in the in the flagship journal and cascade that into the sister journal. Um, and so uh, immediately you're already at a point of advantage because you're receiving a high volume of submissions and you're still publishing those that previously you wouldn't have published. Um, maybe arguably even taking away from potential articles that could have gone to competing publishers or, or competing smaller publishers. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's a really interesting question. I, I think that would probably warrant a, a completely different research question in, in my view. Um, but, uh, but an interesting question, nevertheless. Thank you. Um, any last questions for Jeremy? I know we just hit two o'clock, so I think people are heading off to, <laughs> to other meetings. Um, but I'll just give it a second. OK, well, um, thank you very much for get, taking the time to speak with us today, Jeremy. We greatly appreciate it. Um, for those on the call who are eligible for CME, you can look at the invitation for um, this talk to find the links to fill out the surveys to um, get CME credit. Um, and we um, thank you for joining us and we'll see you at our next continuing ed talk. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Jill. Pleasure to speak today. Yes, Take thanks, care, everyone. Jeremy.